So today we are back to work on my F80 M3 seat time drift car build. We have less than two weeks to build this entire car and get it shipped cross country to start drift week and take it on a two week road trip with a bunch of drifting in between. It's a tall order, but we are hustling and we are doing what we can to get it done. So we've already got one of the most tedious jobs done, the crank pinning. Now we still have some stuff to put back together there, but we were waiting on some parts. So we went ahead and dropped the exhaust out of this thing because we wanted to pull the downpipes off. Now this is a common problem. I had the same issue on my other car where the one downpipe's just a touch too long. And when you put an aftermarket exhaust on it, it doesn't fit in there quite well. So I went ahead and shaved a little bit off of it, got it cleaned up for the new gasket. And then we decided to go ahead and wrap them. This was the main reason we took them out was so that we could heat wrap them. The factory downpipes are very well heat wrapped and heat shielded. And these aftermarket downpipes are not heat shielded at all, just raw stainless. And it's gonna transfer a lot of heat into everything around it. And that's how you tear stuff up. That's how you burn stuff. Drifting things get hot. So we wanted to make sure that we protected these and protected everything that's around them. So we first wrapped them with some Mishimoto header wrap but I don't like using header wrap by itself. So we also use their dimpled heat shielding on top of that. So this holds the header wrap in place and ensures that it won't kind of fall apart and deteriorate and unwind on us. And it allows you to touch the downpipe and work around it without getting super itchy from the header wrap, which is one of my biggest gripes with header wrap. So the header wrap's basically acting as an air barrier between the stainless downpipe and the dimpled heat shield. And between both of those things, it should keep the exterior of these pretty cool and keep the heat heading out the exhaust where it needs to go. So while Josue was working on getting those wrapped up, I had got my spark plug socket in, which is something else that we were waiting on, and decided to go ahead and get the spark plug swapped out. It's gonna be a lot easier to do this now while we have everything apart, so I wanted to make sure we got it done, and I wanted to make sure all of these spark plugs are gonna come out cleanly because I don't know if they've ever been out of this car, and if they haven't, there is the possibility always of one breaking off in the head. So I wanted to get past this and make sure we were good so I can sleep well at night, and fortunately, they all came out. So we got the new plugs ready to go in. We tightened up the gap just a little bit to extend the service life for what we're doing with the car and then went ahead and got them reinstalled. These are a, a definitely an interesting plug. They're very different than a standard plug, which is why we needed this special 14 mil 12 point swivel socket. But all in all, pretty easy process. We got them torqued down and went ahead and got our coil packs back in, which is also an interesting design that's actually more serviceable than most. What a surprise, not something you'd expect with a BMW. So as I finished up that, Josue had finished up wrapping the downpipes. They came out really, really good. I think this is gonna make a world of difference in the longevity and reliability of this car. I think it's something we definitely needed to do. And with that done, we've got another part in I've been waiting on, a plug that goes behind the crank damper. So now we can finally reassemble the front of the engine. We're still waiting on a couple of parts to reassemble the top of the engine, get the intercooler back on and all the piping, but we can at least get this front stuff done, get this out of the way, so it's one less thing we have to worry about as we're tearing into the rest of this car because we've got a lot of tearing into to do. We're gonna be taking a lot of stuff apart, so the more stuff we can put back together now, the less stressful it'll be later on when the time crunch narrows down and, and we're coming up on our deadline. So we get the fan back in, some of the hoses. It's pretty simple, aside from fighting the fan in because it's such a big, beefy fan, it's just hooking up hoses and clamping bracketing lines and little things like that. It all goes back together pretty smoothly. So with that done and out of the way, it's time to move on to the bigger projects and tearing apart the rest of this car, which is gonna be interesting. All right, guys, before we get too deep into today's projects, because spoiler alert, things go a little bit south, uh, I wanna talk to you about today's video sponsor, Factor. So Chrissy and I have been using Factor for a while, and Factor is incredible. It's a meal service that delivers fresh, never frozen meals right to your door and they're ready in two minutes. I've tried over and over again to eat healthy and eat at home. You know, cut out that expensive, not so good for you takeout, but it just never sticks because when it's 8.30 or nine o'clock at night and I just got inside and showered, the last thing I wanna do is deal with trying to find what ingredients we have and pick a recipe. It's just, it's a headache. And now I can eat healthy and have my food ready in two minutes. The crazy thing to me about Factor is, in my experience, the only places that can make really healthy food taste good for people like me who are used to eating not so healthy food was restaurants. But with Factor, everything I've had from them has been 
and delicious. And that to me is probably the most impressive thing. I can grab any one of those meals and I know I'm gonna have a delicious dinner and I'm eating food that is good for me, which is hard to do. And to be able to eat healthy with convenience and save money on takeout, it's, it's just such a win-win. I've just been so impressed by it and it's really made the difference between me sticking with a healthy eating routine and not. Between that and HelloFresh, I mean, Chrissy and I are pretty much covered. And fortunately, Factor is actually now owned by HelloFresh, so whichever one kind of suits your lifestyle, I can get you a discount code. So if you're interested in that discount code, head to factor75.com or click the link down in the description and use code TaylorJoes50 to get 50% off your first box. That's factor75.com and code TaylorJoes50 for 50% off your first box. If you're like me, you're gonna love it and you're gonna wonder how you went so long without it because it's, it's pretty incredible. So that being said, we got a lot of work to do, not a lot of time to do it. We need to get back to it. So let's get into it. We got one of the more tedious projects done, pinning and upgrading our crank hub. We've got that put most of the way back together, just waiting on a couple parts to tidy up everything up here and call that done and dusted, scratch it off the checklist. So now we're moving on to the rest of the drivetrain. We need to get the transmission pulled out of this thing and the entire rear end dropped out of this thing because we're gonna be doing a lot of upgrades back there. We've got some work to do on the interior and we've got a whole new front suspension system to go on it and then more parts from there. But that's just what we've got to worry about right now is that's what we're gonna focus on. So that being said, as much as it's a simple seat time car, there is still a lot of work to do if we want this thing to hold up to two weeks of drifting and road tripping. So I need to quit jibber jabbering and get to work. I'm gonna lift this thing up and start working on tearing the rest of the drivetrain out of it. So one of the really cool things about these cars is that they are incredibly rigid. The chassis on these are super, super stiff for a car without a cage. However, that comes at a bit of a cost and it comes at the cost of serviceability. To make the chassis that rigid, there is a ton of bracing all over the place. And underneath, above, there's a ton of chassis bracing in this car, which generally has to be removed when you're servicing the larger items like we are, which is pulling the subframe out and pulling the transmission out. So it becomes a bit of a multi-step process. I had to pull the plastics out to get to the bolts for the bracing to get those out just to get the heat shield out. But all in all, really not too bad. It was all pretty accessible. So now we drop this thing down. We need to get the e-brake stuff out and just start disconnecting everything that needs to come off so that we can pull the subframe out. So we've got a decent bit of wiring. This has an electronic locking differential. It's got ABS sensors. It's got electric damping control. So there's a decent bit of wiring running through the subframe that we need to make sure we get unplugged, untangled, and out of the way so we don't rip it out on the way down. So with that out of the way, we go ahead and unbolt the shocks, get those ready, and then I wanted to go ahead and test and make sure that we could get the subframe bolts out before we have this thing really close to the ground and it's hard to get a tool in there. So the front seemed a little tight, so I went ahead and put a transmission jack under the subframe to hold it, and basically I wanted to break all of the bolts loose and then snug them back up so it would be easy once we have this thing on the ground. However, that didn't quite go to plan. The rear two bolts came out easy. They both popped loose, no problem at all, exactly what you'd expect. But even with my biggest impact, which has never failed me, it has never failed to remove a bolt ever in the entire time I've had it. It didn't even budge them. They didn't move. They didn't even flinch at that impact. So I tried different extensions, lack of extensions. I've tried heat. I tried a lot of different things to try to make this work. And unfortunately, I tried something I knew I shouldn't have tried and it didn't go well. Well, I knew better than to try and use a breaker bar when the impact didn't do it. The reason I often use impacts is because I've rarely broken bolts with an impact, but it's pretty easy to break a bolt with a breaker bar and with the litter. This is a torque wrench. This isn't even a breaker bar. I didn't even have to put that much force on it and the bolt broke in half. You can kind of see the bolt is just super corroded. This was never coming out. Should have shifted strategies and just done the process in the car, but now we've got a whole lot more work for ourselves because we've got to somehow get that bolt out that wasn't coming out when it had a head on it, which means though, we'll probably have to break this one off to get the subframe out of the way to do that. So this is a great example of why working on cars, it's not so cut and dry. Come up with a plan, we'll figure it out. There's always a solution, but definitely a bummer. We were cruising right along. Now we're stuck with a half end subframe with a broken subframe bolt. So after I got over the sheer sadness of what had just happened and what it meant, and the fact that it meant a lot more work was ahead of me than I already had ahead of me, 
we got back to work. You can only pout for so long. You can only be bummed about it for so long. The longer you sit there being sad about it, the longer it's going to take you to fix it. So we jumped right in on pulling the subframe out. We decided that's what we were going to have to do. There was no way to fix it with the subframe in the car. So we go ahead and get the subframe ripped out of it and pushed out of the way. <laughs> All right. Well, that was definitely about worst case scenario. The probably one of the worst things that could possibly happen taking this car apart is that bolt snapping off in the chassis. So we did get the subframe out. We had to commit once we broke the one, there's no way to fix it without taking the subframe out. So we had to go ahead and snap the other one. Obviously we didn't intentionally snap it, but I knew if the first one wasn't gonna come out clean, neither was that one. And it didn't, of course. So fortunately we do have the subframe out so we can do all our projects. We've got a lot to do here. We're gonna be redoing all these bushings, all these bushings, adding a different rear plate with a second bolt, three pairs of these arms, dual caliper brackets over here. There's, there's a lot that's gonna go on with this subframe, which is why we pulled it out, because it's gonna be a lot easier to do it out on the ground. But that does leave us with our problem here. Now, unfortunately, I never do a great job of filming when things go wrong, because when things are starting to go really wrong and I'm trying to figure out what to do and how to fix it, I, it, filming becomes my lowest priority. I just wanna fix the problem, but it never truly shows what it's like for someone who hasn't dealt with it because it goes from, oh, we have this massive problem to, oh, we've got it fixed, look, and, and you're in a better mood and everything because it's already fixed. But there's a lot of time in between there that you don't really pick up on. So my apologies there. It sucks, <laughs> it's not fun, but you always have to keep your head up and know that there's always a solution. If you keep that in mind, I've said this a lot, but if you keep in mind that there's always a solution, no matter what happens, no matter what the problem is, it, it makes it easier to deal with. Because you know out there on the horizon, there is a solution, you just have to determine what that is. So. We have come up with a solution. We did try a futile attempt to drill it out. I actually drilled literally all the way through the bolt so I could spray PB up in from the top to chase down the threads and it didn't matter. The problem is we can't get to those threads from the top, it's in a cavity. You know, there's sheet metal here and then there's sheet metal up above this and it's in a pocket. Now I did find out by asking PSI if they'd ever seen this that this is actually common. Of course, BMW things. So water gets in there, collects, runs down the threads, corrodes the bolt. And it would make sense that this that would happen to this car because we're in Florida, it's lived in Florida, and it's definitely spent a lot of time outside because a lot of this carbon arrow is faded on the top. So with all our Florida rainstorms, probably got rained on, and with a boroscope up in there, you can see some residual water. You can see like rust puddles. The sheet metal isn't rusting, the coating's still there but there's little puddles of rust from other things. So anyway, that was our problem. And it's pretty apparent when you look at the bolts here, I mean, you can barely tell that thing it has threads on it because there's so much corrosion. I mean, it's bad. I've never seen a bolt this corroded that actually came out. So got the other one out. Uh, I have a plan to fix this. Now, a lot of people would say, just drill it out. But if you ever hear someone tell you, just drill it out, <laughs> they've never tried to drill something out in their life because Drilling a bolt out entirely, drilling it bigger and bigger until the bolt just disappears and saving the threads. It, it's something that sounds normal and easy on paper, but is not normal and easy in real life. So if anyone ever tells you that, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. We tried the easy out, the easy out was gonna snap. If the easy out snaps, it's made of hardened steel. So we're not gonna be able to drill it. And a grade eight bolt with a big head on it snapped. I had, there's no chance this thing's getting it out. And it didn't. We tried, just to be sure, but we've come up with an alternative plan and that is to change this up entirely. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a nice class 10 bolt with this shoulder on it, we're gonna cut the head off, and we're gonna slide this up in there so it locates it and has lateral load rigidity, and then we are going to plug weld it around here. So we're basically gonna convert this from a threaded hole to a stud. So now we'll have a stud to bolt our subframe in at the front, we can bolt it back in, and this problem shouldn't happen again because the water can't interfere with our threads. And I, I'm confident in this working because the subframe is located by these, right? The subframe slides up around these and this is what holds the subframe in place, what squares it up, what keeps it aligned. This is literally just to clamp it in place and keep it from falling out. So we're not worried about this being super precise as if we were just welding this to a metal and trying to mount our subframe to it. So I think this will work. The only downside here is that this car is a newer car and like all newer cars, it has a ton of electronic modules. And just about everything on this car has some sort of module. So welding to the chassis is a little concerning. I've never been one to be scared of welding on a car. I've done it a bunch of times. But with this car having so many modules, it is a bit concerning because if we were to fry all of them, 
we might as well throw the car in the trash. So we're gonna take some precautions there. That's really my biggest concern doing this this way. We're going to go ahead and disconnect the battery. We're gonna disconnect our engine to chassis grounds. We're gonna disconnect our ECU, which is up in there, and disconnect just about any other thing that we can easily get to before we go ahead and weld to it. That way we can hopefully minimize the risk of backflowing current into some form of electronic. We'll also make sure to ground really close by to what we're welding. So the easiest path is for it to go through the ground cable as it's supposed to. Now, if we can do that, if we can get these welded without damaging any modules, I'll be happy. <laughs> you know, if we can just do that, I'll be, I'll be in good spirits. Now, my other point of concern is the spindle nuts. There's like, these are in kind of a pocket with the wheel and my other car is the same way. They get a lot of corrosion in here. So I've soaked everything in PV overnight, but I'm definitely concerned about getting these apart and getting these wheel bearings off, which we have to do to put the dual caliper set up on. However, you know, I'd much rather have something like this break or fail or snap a bolt because this is all replaceable. We can get another knuckle. We can get another subframe. We can get another diff. Obviously I don't want to, but we can. It's, it's not a big deal, but you can't just get another car when a bolt snaps off in the frame rail. So yeah. One of those things, if you haven't experienced something like this yet in cars, trust me, you will at some point and you just gotta keep your head up, get through it, find a solution and keep chucking along, which is what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna quit jibber driver and I'm gonna start disconnecting things and try to get set up, get everything cleaned up, try to get this welded, see if we can't move on to the next thing. So the first bolt that snapped off, snapped off nice and deep, but unfortunately this second one snapped off right by the bolt head. So. We had already drilled it a little bit. I basically just had to drill it the rest of the way out up enough to get the shank of the bolt to go in there and locate well. So we drilled it as much as we could, but since the hole was a little bit off center and that's what makes drilling bolts out tricky, if you're not perfectly center, it's not gonna work once you upsize it. So we went as far as we could and then used the carbide burr on the die grinder to just work out the side of it a little bit, get those little chunks out and we got it opened up enough to where we could slide the bolt in there like we wanted to and weld it in. So from there, we just needed to clean everything up. We are gonna TIG weld this, so that way we have good control and we can keep the weld bead as small as possible. So we need to have clean parts. So we've cleaned that up, we've got the heads cut off the bolts, and now we just need to get those cleaned up. The better we clean these parts, the easier it's gonna to be to do a nice weld and not have to put too much heat into this, which is something we really want to avoid doing when we do this project. All right, well, we're about ready to start on the welding process. Now, the fuel tank is right next to where we need to weld. If something were to happen and this were to catch on fire, it would be terrible. I mean, it would not only likely burn the car up, but it would probably burn the shop up because we can't get the car out of here if something were to go wrong. So we're getting that out of the way. It'll also help give me more room to get around the backside of these, which I'm gonna need to have a really good weld here. So we also got the battery disconnected. I got everything unplugged from the fuse box in the trunk. We got everything unplugged from the ECU. We got our grounds all disconnected. So we disconnected as much stuff as we can. I still need to do this engine to chassis ground to isolate the engine. And without going super deep and pulling the whole engine harness out or the whole chassis harness, you know, we've done, I think that's just about everything we can do to kind of minimize our risk. So next up, we need to just drop this tank out and uh, get ready to weld this thing up. So fortunately, the fuel tank is actually pretty easy to remove. You've got this big cover. We already had the seat off for when we were trying to determine what to do with the stud and see if we could get down into those threads. And basically just one connector, one push to connect fitting, and the fuel tank's pretty much ready to come out. We had to disconnect the filler neck from the bottom and the evap canister, but all in all, pretty much just about as easy as you would expect any fuel tank to be to remove. So it's a little extra work, it's a little extra time, but it's definitely worth it in the long run to make sure nothing bad happens and to give us good visibility and access to these when we weld them. So one of the trickier parts with welding small pieces like this is just trying to hold them where you need them when you go to tack them. Because with a TIG welder, both your hands are taken up. You can't really hold something with one hand and tack it with the other. So we had a little bit of a struggle there, but we got two good tacks on them so they can't move around. And then we wanted to test fit the subframe back in there. It's really important with any sort of fab work to do your test fitting because it's a lot easier to fix a problem when something is tacked than when it's fully welded. Once we weld this, we're committed. So we wanna get the subframe back into position. And the main thing that we're checking for here, we know that they're lined up because the subframe goes in and, and slots around those dowels and that's what locates it. What we need to see is that 
they're square with the subframe. There's a little bit of angle there. So we need to make sure that when we tighten that nut down, it's not crooked because if it is, then it's gonna put all the load on one side of the nut and it's not gonna securely fasten it. So we checked it, everything looked good and we just started committing to welding it out. Now I'm trying to be careful. I'm trying to take breaks. That way one, we don't heat up the things in the chassis. This car still got the full interior in it. But two, more importantly, we don't want to heat up the bolt too much and make it lose a bunch of its temper. So fortunately, they welded pretty good. The corroded side was a little a little messier to, to weld, but really all in all, they welded pretty smooth. It was a nice, easy weld getting into that joint. So with that, I'm happy with it. I'm confident in it. So we can go ahead and put the gas tank back in, get the wiring hooked back up, and see if things still seem to work. We're not going to know for sure until we go to start the car, but at least we can make sure that it is in the condition it was before we did the welding more or less all right well we hooked everything back up plugged everything back in open the door still says hood open it beeps makes the noises i'm pretty happy with how this turned out all things considered you know i I am a little worried about the bolt tempering because as we heat it up, it's gonna lose some of its temper, but I did try to keep it cool. I tried to weld in small portions. I never really got it red hot. So hopefully we're all right. It was the best solution I could come up with. You know, the only other option would be to drill it out, which is soft as those OEM bolts were, you could do, and helicoil it, but I don't know if there's enough meat to drill it bigger and helicoil it without getting into the walls. And then past that, I mean, you'd have to cut an access hole in the top and drop a stud down through after you drilled it out. So neither of those seemed <laughs> very, like very good options. If this holds, great. If not, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it then. But one of those things, not my ideal way to have it done on this car, but hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta roll with the punches. You gotta do what you gotta do when problems are presented. So now we're gonna move on to pulling the transmission out. That's the last big thing that needs to come off of the car. And then from there, it's kind of forward progress. We still gotta take apart the subframe, and but at least that'd be like the last big thing we're taking off the car. It always feels good when you, you cross that hill and you start going the other way and you start putting things back together. I wanna I want get to that point. We've had a rough go at it <laughs> with this whole situation, so are you, uh, you excited to be putting it back together? Yes, some forward progress. It feels so much better. You get to that point where you start putting things back on and you're like, hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, we're gonna lift this thing back up and try to pull the transmission out of it. Send her on up, buddy. So funny enough, the majority of my manual cars have a transmission out of a different car in them. A CD09 350Z transmission in a Miata, a NASCAR four-speed dog box in a Corvette in the front instead of the back, a T56 in a Nissan Sapphiro. It's all over the place and it's always kind of a gamble of if you're going to be able to remove it in the car because it wasn't designed to be in the car. But fortunately, this transmission was designed to be in this car so we know it shouldn't be too terrible to remove it. Now there's a lot of bolts and you gotta use a lot of extensions, man. Whenever you're pulling a transmission, you've gotta stock up on extensions. But other than that, pretty straightforward, pretty simple, all things considered, not too, too bad. All right, transmission is out. Another hurdle jumped. Still gotta get the clutch off, but I'm really happy to have the transmission out. I wasn't sure how difficult it was gonna be. So we need to pull the clutch off, but I think my suspicions are being confirmed with how clean the back of this engine is, that this engine was replaced fairly recently. If you look at like the cylinder head up there, the back of the block, like it's dirty where the clutch is from friction material, but outside of that, it's pretty clean compared to that engine mount to like that, to that engine mount, looks pretty minty. So anyway, we're gonna drop this thing down and start pulling the clutch off of it so we can get our new clutch on. I'll show you, I'll show you what we got for that here in a minute. Let's get this one off first so we can call this assembly done. <laughs> so with our string of luck with the subframe bolts and things like that, I was definitely sweating getting this clutch off. I was really hoping we didn't have any issues getting these flywheel bolts out. They're Torx bit bolts, so I knew if, if they were overly tight, if they didn't wanna come out, it was gonna be a nightmare. I mean, it, oh man, it would be bad. So I was just ready to get this off and be done with it. Oh, we did it. Beautiful. Clutch is out. Successful mission. Sigh of relief. Sigh of relief. <laughs> Here is our stock clutch. 
You can see it's actually in pretty good shape. Still a lot of friction material left. This factory is a dual mass flywheel, so basically has some give. So that's what makes it really smooth and easy to drive, but it's not so great for drifting or performance driving. With drifting, the clutch gets worked a lot. I mean, you're clutch kicking, you're getting on and off the handbrake, so you're you know bringing the clutch in and out, and you know, kind of like a, an expert move or a more advanced move in tandem is to slip the clutch when you're getting on someone's door to slow the car down. So the clutch gets worked a lot. I mean, it just, it's under a lot of strain. So I tend to go with a clutch that's rated for a bit higher power than the car makes because it's gonna be under extra strain for what we're doing with it, if that makes any sense. So we went with a Clutch Masters FTX 1000. This is a really, really nice clutch. I'm impressed. This is my first Clutch Masters clutch, and uh, it's a really, really nice kit. Like, they, they give you everything you need. It's, I'm impressed. So, because the factory flywheel's dual mass, it's really thick, so they have to make theirs really thick. One of the cool things about this clutch, this specific one, is it has one clutch disc with no springs, and then the other clutch disc, the one closer to the pressure plate fingers, is sprung. So you get kind of a mix of a race clutch and a street clutch. You know, street drivability is really important to me. And it comes with a new fork, a new throwout bearing, and a nice, very specific pilot tool. Again, pretty, pretty impressed with this kit. Another cool thing is because they're able to make the flywheel like this, everything is replaceable. So we can replace the friction surface here. We can replace each disc. We can replace the floaters. So if we ever have, if we ever just wear this clutch out, we can replace just the few parts, the wear items, and keep the bulk of the clutch, which is the expensive part. So I, I think that's pretty neat. That one, for what we're doing, should last us a very long time, assuming we put it in, right? <laughs> Uh, you can see on the transmission here, we're going to replace this, we're going to replace this. I did mean to get a pivot ball here, and I forgot. Anyway, I'm Jibber Jabber, and I'm stoked that we got all that out. The only disassembly left is the subframe itself, obviously taking it apart. I'm still worried about those, uh, those axles there, but hopefully we can get all that apart and start working on this, and then pulling the front suspension apart to do our angle kit. That's really the last bit of disassembly off the car, but man, we've got this thing pretty well stripped down. Talk about things escalating quickly. We've literally pulled the entire driveline out of the car with the exception of the engine, which we did very tedious work on the engine itself, so. <laughs> One of those things, but honestly, I'm pretty glad we did this because uh, we've gotten really well acquainted with the car, you know? I now know and have a mental image of how everything goes in there, how everything works. You know, I'm not flying blind if I have a clutch issue or, you know, a clutch hydraulics issue and having no idea what it even looks like. You know, now we know. So I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's kind of a good training session for us to get familiar with the car. So that being said, we are out of time. This has been a debacle. That, that subframe bolt situation really uh, threw us back a day, but hopefully we can uh, keep making good forward progress and get this thing done in time for Drift Week. So stay tuned, see if we do. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and end it here, but thank you guys for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Hope to see you next time. Goodbye.